talking about the equivalence between, or to think about utilities as some kind of unnormalized surprise values or surprise value as a particular kind of utility. And what's um, important, and we'll come back to that, is that <coughs> here I have introduced the utility of the whole event space, right, the, the reference um, utility, which is given now by, we said already, the log partition sum, right? So if I have, so if you think about this now, if I have the utility of all the x's, so I have the space omega, right, and I cut it up into little pieces, x, and now I ask, and, and, and I tell you what is the u of each x, right? And now I ask you, what is the value of the whole thing, right? This is where we come back in a minute, again, when we talk about the certainty equivalent. Then, this is the value of the whole thing, okay? It's not just an expectation value of the, of the individual use or a sum of these use or something like that, right? This is what it is. <coughs> Now, if, um, if alpha goes to zero, actually, it will just be an average of these u's, right? But in general, it will be like this. So we, we raised before this issue of the alpha. It's a translation um, factor, right? And here, for example, it translates between, say, the units of utilities and the, and the units of nuts or bits or whatever you choose as a... Oh, sorry. Um, I have to write higher, right? It's okay, it's okay. I write it again. Um, uh, here. It's okay. Um, sorry, I didn't think about this before. Right? This is the normalization of the probability. This is in the case when you take the surprise value, right? I'm just basically solving this for uh, uh, P, right? And then writing it like this. Or now if we have unnormalized utilities, right? Then we have this, basically. So I said that this corresponds to this. Right? That the surprise value corresponds to the utilities when they're normalized. Right? And this normalization factor corresponds, so to say, to the value of the whole thing. That's my point. Right? Um, okay. Uh, now the screen's gone. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So now we said the computation, right, is going from a prior to the. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe like this. Compromise. <laughs> it's okay. I, I don't need the screen actually. It's okay. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll leave it down then, yeah? Okay. Oops. Sorry. Thanks. Um, Okay, so we said computation is going from a prior to a posterior, right? And uh, we said that basically, how does that happen if I impose an extrinsic utility, right? I was saying the example, I put money and all of a sudden you do something else than you would naturally do. Um, and so how can we think about this? So we, we think that we change the energy function or the utility function, right, by adding a delta u, okay? That's the operation of putting money or something like that. And then the overall utility changes. So if I want to include that um, into this sort of thinking, right, then I basically I write Q and P just exactly in the way that I introduced it here. Right? I just write P uh, depending on this use, right? And I have this exponential and the translation factor. Um, and now I expand P because I assume that P is 
is basically the original utility plus a new utility, a utility difference, right? And then I can re-express this part that depends on Q as Q, right? So that I just have the change in utility that I have in the exponential, right? So it's very, very simple manipulations. Um, and then basically I can interpret this that I have a prior distribution Q, right? I'm of doing something. The utility, so this is what you would do naturally without being paid or something like that. Then there's a utility difference because there's a change in the external utility, right? So if you're a particle, maybe a magnetic field is switched on. If you're a human, maybe somebody pays you to do something. If you're an animal, maybe your environment changed, right? For example, I don't know, there's a big predator coming, okay? So that means utility function changed drastically. Um, and your behavior is altered accordingly, okay? Um, and what's interesting, and this is what we're going to look at again, is now this, um, this delta F, right? Because this is sort of the baseline. Um, so this simple update um, has many interesting correspondences in literature. One is, of course, you could say it's like a Bayesian update, right? I go from prior to posterior, and this is my uh, sort of the, what corresponds to the likelihood, right? So you will find this formula, for example, in uh, people that have looked at Bayesian search. Um, this would be then interpreted something like a search cost. So Jane's, for example, has worked on this. Um, or you can find this also as a, <coughs> um, a version of the replicator equation in, if you are interested in evolutionary game theory or just like doing um, evolutionary modeling, right? Because in that case, X would be a distribution over different species in your population. Um, this would be sort of the fitness of X, right? This would be the average fitness in the population. And then the, the simple interpretation is in all of these, if my fitness as X is larger than this sort of reference value, the probability of X will increase. If it's smaller than this reference value, probability of X will decrease. Right? And that's true for evolution, but also for Bayesian updating and so on. <clears throat> so what is this delta F now? So this delta F is what we can think of as the uh, certainty equivalent for this change in utility. Okay? So we regard now Q as the thing that you would do naturally. Um, so that's why we don't write it anymore as a utility. Um, <clears throat> and we're asking now, what does this delta U, what kind of change does it induce? Um, and what does this delta F mean? So again, this delta F has this form of a, basically like a log partition sum, except that it has these probabilities here now as well. Um, and that gives it a nice property that for all the different uh, limits of alpha, this value is well defined now. Okay, so such that we can interpret this alpha as some kind of a rationality parameter. So for example, if alpha goes to infinity, that means that you have basically unlimited uh, computational power, right? And you can choose the best x that you want, okay? The prior is irrelevant. You just optimize perfectly this external utility, okay? If alpha goes to zero, that corresponds to the case where you have no computational power. In that case, you cannot change from your prior distribution, right? You do, you, sti you stick with Q, and the best you can hope for to earn is basically the expected utility gain under the distribution Q, because you were not able to change. For any alpha in between, you're in between these two, right? So you see that here in this graph, on the x-axis, there's this rationality parameter. And you see here for zero, you have this expectation value. And the more uh, alpha you have, right, the higher your uh, certainty equivalent becomes. Um, and we can also have a, a negative, 
right? We can try that out. In that case, the uh, value goes to the minimum. Um, why is that interesting? Well, there's two reasons this could be interesting. One is, for example, if you were to anticipate an opponent, right? To be able to say, okay, what is the worst they can do to me? It's important when you plan, like in these minimax trees. Um, but this is also important when you talk about robust decision making, okay? And so you're planning for worst case scenarios, essentially. And we'll come back to that later. Um, so, <clears throat> so the important thing here is that we want to um, advance the idea that this Basically, this delta F should replace the notion of the certainty equivalent, okay? It includes the expectation operation as a special case, but it allows for many more uh, certainty equivalent operations depending on the resource parameter alpha. Um, now, if you want to basically relate this, right, to the initial picture I was showing you where you have basically, we said that... Uh, we have this set X, we want to choose something, and then this is the set of acceptable ones, and then we said, okay, maybe we have a distribution over that, right? So the initial set X also may not be a uniform distribution, right? This would be the distribution Q, and then we change that through deliberation through to the distribution P, right? That's the idea. Uh, and, we, and we do, the reason we do change is because our um, utility function has changed, right? Okay, so here's another interesting aspect of this uh, delta F, okay? Um, and here is uh, something that basically is like a simple physics example, but you can get, this is nothing special about physics, um, you get this uh, basically just from simple mathematical considerations. Um, so the idea is that so this delta F in, in physics gives you basically the best that you can get out of a system in terms of work, okay? And then work usually means pushing pistons. If you've ever sit, sat in a thermodynamics class, that's what you do all the time. And then you would express in the best case the free energy as a, basically the work that you do with the piston, pushing against the pressure and so on. But the, the details here are not so important. Um, but now imagine that instead of having one piston, we have several small pistons, okay, that we push, and then we can basically express what is the work for each of these small pistons. And again, now you would think, okay, maybe the work of the big piston is the expectation value of the small system, uh, pistons, but that's not true. What you get is essentially that it is this expectation value plus an extra sort of um, information cost, right? And it's exactly the same, what I just said a few slides earlier, where basically you have this space, you split it up into different regions, right? You say, okay, I know the utilities for these regions, how do I get the utility of the whole thing? So it's basically um, what physicists would call cost graining, right? So depending on how far you want to zoom in, okay? So if I know the energies for these compartments, what is the energy of the bigger compartment? And the important thing is that it's not just the expectation value, but you have this extra term. And essentially, um, where this comes from is that um, if you postulate that there's this relationship between probabilities and utilities, right, through the log function, and you also postulate that the laws of probability hold, right? So also, for example, if we now introduce a new partition, right, this should sum to one, but, you should, but also if I sum over x and y, but if I sum just over x, right, this should be equal to p of y, so because I have the marginal and so on. And if I want to represent the marginal also like this, right, as an exponential of some utility, right, then, um, this utility will have this kind of shape, okay? That's basically where it comes from. So, but it's simply, it has this recursive, um, like, property for this cost graining. So, in, so one could even argue, okay, if you want to take this idea to the extreme, that 
that the utilities don't exist. The only thing that exists are these free energies, right? Because everything that you call a utility, if you would zoom in further and partition the space even smaller, you would find out that, okay, there's now again an energy for this small and this small and this small, like Y or Z or whatever you want to call this, right? And then, it, and then <clears throat> what you put here would again be a free energy, right? And we could say, okay, now we've partitioned with X, now we take each X and partition it further with Ys or something like that. It would again be another free energy. So it just depends how far you want to basically zoom into um, the reality and the bottom level where you stop zooming in, you call this is the utility. But if you could zoom in more, it would again be like a free energy, if you see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> and it would always have this sort of recursive relationship. Okay, um, so now we want to see how we can uh, think of this in terms of a variational principle. So we start with this first line here. Where does that come from? It's just uh, this line. If I solve this for delta F, right, then I would get this. So this is only very simple manipulations. Um, and now, this has to be true. So if P is chosen as this, what we call the equilibrium distribution, okay, if it is chosen like this, then this top equation is true for every single X. And of course, then it's also true if I take an expectation with respect to some W, right? And then, <clears throat> so this is equally true. And then you notice that um, if I now change this P as a W, right, then I would have a variational principle such that if W is equal to P, I would get an extremum. Okay, so that means that this distribution here becomes the extremum of this uh, functional. Does that make sense? Okay, so basically we've created um, a variational principle to find the equilibrium distribution, right? So we can try out now all probability distributions W and the one that is the best is this one, okay? And then you could, um, so this is again the relative entropy, right, between W and Q, the Kleibler divergence that we mentioned before. Um, now it's returned as promised. Um, yeah, and of course, so this is saying the same thing, just in a different writing, right? So it's a variational principle, so if you basically try out all the different uh, probabilities, you will find that this is the best one. Okay, so here's an example um, where this holds, maybe one that you know already or you've discussed already, um, variational Bayesian inference. So variation based on inference is a technique that's used in machine learning when you want to compute Bayesian posteriors, but they're so complicated that you can't do that. So <clears throat> say, for example, this is the posterior of your hypothesis H given some data, the true one, that um, you cannot compute or represent, and, but you have some other distribution, for example, a Gaussian, that would be the distribution Q, and you want now to find the best distribution Q to approximate the true posterior as much as possible, okay? Um, and usually, this problem is formulated like this, right? And you would have a natural, um, so this is always a strictly positive quantity, right? So you have a, a lower bound given by the likelihood of the data, and you just basically change Q. So for example, you could change the mean and the variance of the Gaussian to minimize this, right? This is how 
it's usually studied. Um, but we can rewrite this basically in a form that such that the variational inference looks exactly the same format that we've been looking at now. Um, namely, uh, we basically we split this posterior into prior and likelihood, right? Um, the log likelihood, we treat it as if it was a utility, right? And then we have basically a trade-off between uh, the two terms. One is to maximize the utility, and the other one is um, this information term, right? And the distribution that trades off these two things optimally is basically the same one that you will get here, right? So maybe I didn't say that explicitly on the previous slides. I should have said that. Um, so the idea here is that this, with this variational principle, right, you, you trade off two things. On the one hand, you want to choose a distribution that gives you as much utility gain as possible, right? And on the other hand, you have these sort of information processing costs, okay? There's some something that you lose in the value because you have to move away from the prior distribution, right? And we can think, and if you want to give this a bound rationality interpretation, is that this is costly, right? Moving away from the prior distribution is costly. You have to do some kind of, you have to spend resources, okay? And whatever resource you spend, whether it's time, money, or whatever, right? It should be monotonous in this, uh, DKL, right? So for every extra resource that you invest, you want to be able to rule out more bad alternatives, so to say, right? If you don't do that, then don't spend the extra resource, right? It, it must bring you somehow a little bit closer to what you want, okay? So that's why we can think about this kublak leibler divergence as a, as a general um, information processing cost. That's the idea, right? And here, um, in the example of the variational inference, we can think of it like that, right? On the one hand, we want to optimize the likelihood of the data, right? On the other hand, we don't want to move away too far from the prior. And these two things are traded off. Okay, so now here's a, a little example um, to make it a bit more intuitive. So imagine you have to choose between four different actions, okay, A1 to A4, and imagine that this is the utility function for each action. So this example is a little bit engineered to uh, basically um, like hammer home the message, but it's maybe still useful. Um, so it's engineered in a way that action A1 and A4 almost have the same utility, but A4 is a tiny bit better, okay? So maybe you cannot see it, that's why I'm telling you. And A2 and A3 are basically a little bit rubbish, okay? And let's say initially, you don't have any preference amongst the actions, so let's assume we have a uniform prior. And now, <clears throat> so this beta is now the alpha from the previous slides, right? So if we have a, a low beta, right, then essentially, but it's not zero, right? So then essentially we put most probability mass on A1 and A4. If we have a very high beta, it means lots of rationality, we figure out that actually A4 is the best, right? And we put all probability mass on A4, okay? Um, so now look at these plots, right? So this is the beta, the rationality parameter against the utility. So you see that very quickly, right? very quickly your expected utility is close to the maximum. Why? Well, because choosing between, you only have to do, right, you don't have to solve for two bits, but only one bit. This is what you see in this graph, right? With one bit of information spent, right, you can basically choose between this, you distinguish this and this versus this, right? The rubbish versus not so rubbish states. And that's enough to give you uh, good utility. If you want to improve even more, right, to spend the extra bit of information will be a lot of effort, but result in hardly any utility gain. 
Okay? That's the point. So you can achieve almost, not 100, but 95% of the utility with one bit. Um, and then it becomes more and more and more expensive. Okay? So when you have limited resources, it makes sense to ask, how should I spend them? Right? So if you can only spend one bit, which two sets do you want to distinguish? Well, distinguish the ones that bring more utility from the bad ones. Right? <clears throat> That's the best way to do it. Okay, so here is um, an example of how this could be like a mechanistic example. Okay, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You produce one bit of information, which, because the prior is uniform, corresponds to exactly making this distinction between these two sets. What happens if the utility is uncertain? What happens if the utility is uncertain? Um, well, the way. So this would already be an advanced example, okay? But I would say the way to do it is you would have, what you have to do is you would have to say that the utility does not only depend on x, but on some hidden variable z, mm -hmm. right? And then you have a distribution p of z that could or could not depend on x, mm -hmm. right? And then you basically, you have to apply uh, the, this reasoning um, for two random variables. And then you dissolve it that way, um, but that's already that would already be an advanced example, so to say. Because effectively, then I would be overfitting, right? I, I would be going for with a high meter. Oh, here, mm -hmm. if the yeah, if you have uncertainty as well in your learning, yeah. Because basically, I'm disregarding the complexity cost mm -hmm. in moving uh, the posterior radial triangle. Yeah, that's right. Okay, but my point here is that even if you don't have uncertainty, right, so this is, this is what I was saying about chess, right? Chess is boring, there's no uncertainty, but actually we're limited and there is uncertainty. So, I'm, so the same is here, right? This example is so simple, you even you can query each value of the utility, so in, in that sense there's no uncertainty, but still you could be limited, and still then it could be optimal to do this in a certain sense, if you're bounded optimal. Otherwise, it would indeed make sense to put 100% in this scenario. But if you have uncertainty on top, of course, then even that doesn't make any sense. That's right. OK. Um, so here is a little example, like a, a simple mechanistic process. Um, the process itself is not so important, just to give you an idea um, how to think about this whole framework. So <clears throat> rejection sampling. It's a method that was invented by von Neumann, I think, so it's very old. Um, and the task is to obtain a sample from a distribution P, right? Um, but the problem is you cannot sample from P. You can only sample from a distribution P0, okay? And they basically he engineered this method where he said, okay, let's now assume also I uh, sample from a uniform distribution, this U, right? And I sample an X from the P0, which would be our prior, right? Um, and then I decide whether to accept X or not, right? And if I accept the right X and throw away the right X, then my samples from my accepted samples from P0 will be as if they're drawn from P, okay? That's the idea of this method. Um, why am I telling you about this? Because <clears throat> the question is, what do these formulas mean that I'm showing you? Do they mean that you actually have to compute this free energy and make this trade-off and so on? The answer is no, right? This is just a, like a, a description. Of course, you could do that if you wanted to, um, but you don't have to. So for example, here, you have a decision maker that has never computed the free energy in, in his life, okay? So all he does is he samples from P0, the prior, then he looks at the utility of the sample, right? and has this acceptance rule. So he has a, a target value, and he says, OK, if the utility of my sample is the target or above, I accept for sure. If the utility is smaller than my target, I also accept, but with a probability. Okay? 
And if it's far away from my target, then I will not accept because the acceptance probability becomes very small. Right? It's like, I don't know. This is this, you can think of it as a stochastic version of satisficing. Right? The T tells you what's basically what's your goal, um, and then you accept basically with respect to that. So if you do that, um, <clears throat> you, um, you are guaranteed basically to draw samples from P even though, and, and it's enough to do a single sample, right? You, to make a decision, you just need to produce one sample. You don't need to know the whole distribution. Um, so you generate a sample from P and you're done. And you don't need to compute this free energy stuff and so on. You don't need to solve a constraint optimization problem. You just optimize these use until you run out of resources. And it's clear, the more samples that you look at, right? And that is again where this alpha parameter comes in. How strict are you? Are you only content with the optimum, right? So if this is your, if this is your, say, T, okay? Are you going to um, accept? So this is the acceptance probability, right? This is one. P accept. Uh, are you going to accept things that are s worse? So this is the utility axis, right? Worse, or are you basically strict and say, I accept this with probability one and otherwise zero, right? Um, and of course, if, you, if you're very strict, the stricter you are, the more samples you will need to see on average, right? To, to find one that has this high utility when you're sampling from the prior. And so it's clear that, um, the more alpha you want, right, the stricter you want to be, the better you want to be, the more samples you have to spend. Right? And you can actually, in this simple case, compute the amount of samples. Um, <clears throat> and what's important is how it has to be, because that makes sense. Right? It has to be a, a, a monotonous function in the DKL. Right? The more DKL you want, the more samples you have to spend, so to say. I mean, it makes sense, right? And so, as I said, the idea of this slide was not so much to promote rejection sampling or anything like that. It's just to say that you can basically, even if you don't optimize this sort of equations explicitly, I can look at you, right, and say, okay, that's what you're doing. So that's also an argument against these, um, uh, against people that say that um, it doesn't make sense to look at a bound rationality as an optimization problem. Um, because of the, you optimize the constraint optimization and then you're basically back where you started. But that's what we're doing, right? This guy is not optimizing a constraint optimization problem. He's just trying to optimize the utility until he runs out of resource. Um, but still we can then look at this guy and say, okay, he's acting as if he was basically uh, computing P, right? Okay, so we can use this bound rationality as a normative framework where we basically put information on the one axis and expect the utility on the other axis, right? So I'm saying if I've, I'm given a particular task, a particular utility function, right, and a prior. Now, given I spend a certain amount of information, what is the best utility I can achieve, right? And that gives me this efficiency boundary. And everything above the boundary is unachievable. It doesn't matter what kind of algorithm you come up with. So it's a little bit like Shannon's plot, the rate distortion plot, where we're saying right, that the, you can say this is the, with this distortion, this is the best information. And here it's the same. If you, for a particular task with a particular utility, right, if you spend one bit of information then this line shows you what is the best um, utility that you can achieve with this amount of information, right? And no matter how you build your agent, you will not be able to achieve more, okay? And it's, it's a, quite a, a simple statement because the utility in the end, uh, the information tells you how many distinctions you can make in the world, right? And if you have more information, you can make more distinctions. And if you can make more distinctions, then you have a better chance of finding something better. <clears throat>
right? I guess. Um, <clears throat> but again, this curve does not tell you any kind of mechanism of how you would find such a policy, right? Just like in Shannon's case, uh, it doesn't say how to find a code. It just tells you there is something. Um, so <clears throat> there's also nobody saying that you have to lie on this line, right? You could be below the line. You cannot be above the line, but you can be below, right? Um, so I could measure you in an experiment. I give you a utility function. I measure your uh, behavior. So I have the probability P. I know what utility you achieve, right? Uh, I can compute from the probability what is the information that you've produced, and then I can put you as a dot in this plane, right? And then I can look how close are you to this efficiency frontier, right? And I can even determine um, an efficiency parameter by saying, okay, how close are you to the line, essentially? How bounded optimal are you? Okay, so this line basically tells you what is the bounded optimal behavior, so to say. And uh, the perfect one, of course, would be the one where you're uh, basically on top, where you can spend the maximum information that you need to solve the task perfectly. Okay, so the idea is, just to sum up now quickly, that we have one variational principle, right, where we basically vary this distribution P, and the same principle can be used to describe action, perception, and learning. Why am I saying that? Because, as, as I said to you already, that we can model Bayesian inference like that. If we take the utility to be the log likelihood, right, um, and then we look for the best P, which will be just the Bayesian posterior in that case. Um, so obviously with Bayesian inference, we can model learning and perception. Um, we can also use this to model bounded decision making, like I was just arguing. Um, and we can also model the same thing to uh, model robust decision making. I'll come back to that later, because I um, don't have to explain it twice then. Um, okay, so we have a utility function, a prior, it's like a resource parameter. We transform the prior into the posterior, right? That's, that's the idea. Okay, um, what are we doing with time? Um, so maybe the next slides, I go a little bit quicker, so it's not so important to understand all the details, just to give you an idea that this can also be applied to more complex scenarios, right? So, so far, we just looked really at uh, the whole time, we looked at the most simple scenario, choose an apple versus a banana, basically, right? This is so simple that if you open an economics book, usually there's not so much time spent on this particular example, right? So we spent a lot of time on that. Um, okay, so you can apply it, for example, to multi-step decisions, right? Um, so in this case, now you look at a trajectory of x1 to xt, and we have, assume we have a utility function for this trajectory, right? And then we write down the same optimization problem as before, right? It's the same trade-off. Um, and we get the same solution. Okay, so so far nothing interesting has happened, but the interest, maybe more interesting part is now if we look at each individual x through time, right? And then we make more assumptions. We could assume, for example, that the probabilities are Markovian. We could assume, for example, that utilities are additive for each x. Why would we assume that? Well, because these are basically assumptions that people often make when they solve like Markov decision processes or something like that. Um, if we do that, right, and we basically put these assumptions into our um, equation, then we find that we can write it in a sort of a, a recursive fashion, right? It's basically like this tree where if I wiggle now with px1, everything here will move, right? That means that affects everything. If I just wiggle with the last decision, that will just affect the last part, right? And so <clears throat> what I have to do is just backward induction, like we said earlier, I would solve this last problem first, then that gives me my utility value to solve the next problem, and so I work my way backwards, right? 
Um, so that's what I'm doing here, right? So this would be the last problem, the utility of the last one. And uh, so that would give me my solution probabilities for each xt. When I do that, then I realize that the, right, so if I put this back into the equation there, then the value for this decision is actually given again by the log partition sum. Also shouldn't be surprising because that's what we've been saying the whole time, right? And then basically you get a recursive relation between these log partition sums at time t and time t minus one, right? You can basically express it like that um, if you want. Um, for example, Emma Todorov has done something similar. It's just written it slightly differently. Uh, something he called Z iteration, um, which he basically proposes as a way to solve uh, Markov decision problems in a very efficient way. And what you have to do is you have to basically express, we'll come to that in a minute again, the Markov decision problem slightly differently than you usually do. Not that you have separate actions, but that you somehow you can manipulate directly the transition probabilities. And if you do that, basically then, because of this, you can solve the MDP just with linear matrix operations, okay? Um, so this would be something that would just, uh, yeah, fall out of here of this, I mean, bounded rationality analysis. So what I'm trying to show you is that with this simple kind of reasoning, you can connect a lot of different um, research projects. Um, we can also, uh, instead of looking at the partition sum, we can look at the log partition sum, define that as the value, right? Then instead of the recursion for psi, you get a recursion for V, Right, um, which would basically look like this. Um, and now if you take uh, alpha to zero, so here I have the inverse, so that would mean you have basically infinite resources in this case. So you can define, so it depends whether you define the temperature or the inverse temperature, whether it's zero or infinity. Um, so don't be confused about that. Um, but basically what you get now in the limit is that you always pick the minimum, right? And what you get is uh, a, a version of the Bellman recursion, okay? A very simple version of the Bellman recursion where you always work yourself backwards, right? And you say, okay, I take the, the best value is the one that optimizes the cost of the next step and then the value of whatever comes afterwards, right? And with this, you can do a backward recursion uh, and compute the value for everything. So, so you can say, um, so this is the basic idea of dynamic programming, right? So you could say that this dynamic programming um, proposal from Bellman is also a special case when you have the perfect minimum or maximum operation where this, with this alpha, you would extend this to basically bounded rational decision makers that are not able to pick only the maximum, but that would have like broader distributions, say around the maximum, for example. The same idea can also be applied to continuous problems. So here's one example where we're looking at paths. So this is something that I did when I was in Stefan Schall's lab in the robotics lab. Um, so <clears throat> you can basically now have an object, it's a path, it's like a continuous function, right? And then define again the same optimization criterion. You get the solution. That's also not interesting. The normalization constant would be this, right? So this normalization constant now, as you see, is an integral over paths, right? Because to normalize, you have to always go over all the alternatives. So here it would be all alternatives paths. So that would be a so-called path integral. Um, and then, <clears throat> so, so how can you... Uh, have such a system. So for example, what you could do is you could say, okay, I have, a, I have a system that evolves according to a certain differential equation, and then I have a bounded rational decision maker, right, that produces a control signal with some noise here, okay? Um, and it has this 
utility function that is sort of the continuous equivalent of additivity, I guess. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so we have essentially diffusion processes then, right? And maybe the mathematics here are a little bit more intricate then, okay? So you can basically rephrase this path integral as a differential equation related then to um, the hamilton jacobi bellman optimality equation that you would usually use to solve these tasks. Um, anyway, and you get out a solution where the optimal bound rational controller would be just following the gradient in the log partition sum. Um, and essentially what you can do to operationalize this, and that's what then people did in Stefan Schaal's lab. So this, uh, this path integral control was invented by Bert Kappen and uh, Evangelos, who was working in Stefan's lab, then used it for the high dimensional robotic control. And uh, what I did was just to show how this fits in with this kind of framework. Um, you get then a controller that basically, or you say that the, basically the drift of the controller, because I said the controller is a drift diffusion process, is just a probabilistic superposition of controls where these probability weights are essentially just the Boltzmann factors that take into account the natural, like the intrinsic utility of the particle, how it would move, right? Um, and the cost. Um, and so in, in the end, what you can do is you can sample random controls, you compute the Boltzmann factors for these trajectories that you've randomly generated, right? And that will basically give you um, a bound rational controller, right? And they use that quite robustly to um, yeah, all kinds of tasks. What's nice about it is that you don't need to compute any derivatives or anything like that. So this is quite a robust um, method. Okay, so with these two uh, things that I've just shown you, the temp, so we had now paths instead of individual events but the temperature or this resource parameter was the same across time. It doesn't have to be like that. In principle, right, and this is what I showed you with these trees in the beginning, you could have at every node um, a different resource parameter, right? So now here, it's in the same still for every time step, um, but you could have even each individual node different as well. And that way you can create arbitrary decision trees, right? Um, and depending on this um, parameter, how you choose it, right, whether you choose it positive or negative, you can create different kinds of behaviors. So if you, for example, if you choose it, uh, say, infinitely positive, then it would correspond to a max operation. If it's zero, it corresponds to the expectation operation. If it's infinite negative, it would correspond to minimum operation. But if you choose them, these values in between somewhere, right, you can have anything in between and combine that. Um, yeah, so you can create uh, rational behavior, bounded rational behavior, you can create robust behavior, so we'll look at these examples in a minute. And you can basically, so this would be a decision tree with completely arbitrary uh, resource parameters, and you can then create, of course, again, a backward induction, um, in this case, that would be a generalized Bellman equation, right, or dynamic programming equation. You say, okay, what is the value of this point up there? It's the value of the uh, immediate cost plus the value of whatever comes next. And of course, all the values would be given by free energies. Um, okay, so that was just to say that you can go beyond the simple banana apple example that I was discussing with you most of the time. Um, and that would conclude the first part. Um, so if there's no questions, then I would start with looking at some attempts of ours to use this to like these abstract things that we've talked about to relate that somehow to reality, which is also challenging. Yeah? Um, Okay, so, so I'm going to describe now just a, a series of experiments to you to see um, how could we 
apply these things, as I said. Um, so we start with a recent study um, where we looked at, okay, how close do humans get to this optimum, right, to this efficiency frontier. Then we have quite a few studies on the topic of model uncertainty that I keep mentioning but never really told you the details. Um, and then this is just a short, uh, like a, more like a machine learning paper to bring these two ideas together, model uncertainty and limited uh, processing capabilities for action selection. And then I want to also uh, explain to you the idea why bound rationality um, is basically uh, a source for forming abstractions. Okay, so the idea is that abstractions are like uh, useful because they save um, information processing and allow you to deal with the world in an efficient way. Okay, and we're also currently working on an experiment here. Okay, so how efficient are humans when they make decisions if we want to apply this bounded rationality theory? So we had a a very simple task, um, a reaching task. So subjects had to reach to one of these four circles. Um, <clears throat> one of them would be selected from a probability distribution and then you have to move to this circle, okay, very fast. Um, and then we look at the endpoint distribution of your reach, okay. And essentially what we did was that the movement time so once you started moving, it was always the same. So the movement was always the same, um, but the reaction time, that means the planning time, was different. Okay? So we had a condition where you had to react very fast. So that was like on the order of 200 milliseconds. Okay? You, have to, you see the target and you have to immediately move. Uh, and the slow condition was, I think, like 250 milliseconds or so. So that doesn't sound like there's a big difference, but it's quite a big difference, okay? It's non-linear, highly non-linear, this relationship. Um, okay, and the idea was that if I give you different amount of planning the movement, right, um, would that show in the quality of your movement and, of course, also the information that you generate, right? That means, essentially, in the end here, the variance that you generate, okay? And how efficient do you do this trade-off? Okay, so as I said, we basically, we have to distinguish planning from execution. The utility function in this task, right, is either you hit the target or you don't, right? These are the four, the four different world states, the four different possible targets. If you hit, you get utility of one. If you miss, you get zero. Now, <clears throat> the thing that makes this paradigm a bit more complicated is that, um, that there's also execution noise, okay? So people know that when you basically execute a movement just from your muscles, um, there is, uh, I mean, this was also illustrated with Wilhelm Tell, right? He could aim as long as he wanted, so in that sense there was no planning restriction, but still there's a noise. Um, and this is execution noise, and we don't want to basically um, mistake the one for the other, because we want to know how much the time I give you for planning affects your movement variability, not what comes from your arm, okay? Um, and so we need to estimate this execution noise somehow. And the way we did that is that we said, okay, there's always, we had basically uh, uh, trials where we only had one target and you always went to the same target. It was always on the same spot, right? So in terms of planning, there was, I mean, you still had to plan the movement, I guess, but you always knew where the target was, right? You didn't have to uh, make a plan on the fly. Um, and we can measure the distribution that you generate there, right? And this we take as the noise that comes basically from the execution. This would be the execution noise. Um, and so what we get in the space of planning, right, when we look for the aim point, is basically a convolution of this 
hard utility with this execution noise, so to say, right? Because in your brain, you basically have to take this execution noise into account. And you should say, okay, what is the probability of hitting and so on? And this would be, if you assume that you know the execution noise, would be this utility function that you see there on the left, okay? And now we assume that there's some kind of planning process that uses this utility function on the left to find the best action depending on how much planning time you have. Okay? That's the idea. And this will give us the best planning uh, number, uh, uh, action. Of course, the problem is we cannot observe that action. So again, we have to convolve that with the execution noise to get a distribution over endpoints. And this is then what we can basically compare to our actual data, right? So that's the problem when you, yeah? How did you practically implement this with the 200 milliseconds and the 250, where people, they have a barrier between them? No, so what we did was that, um, so the target appeared, right? And if you would not, so basically you had to leave the home position in the reaction time limit. Right? And if that was not the case, then you had the screen telling you were too slow, and then the next trial would start. Right? So, of course, you want to avoid these too slow trials as a subject because they just extend your experiment. And so you try to be as fast as possible. And once you moved out, right, the 300 milliseconds start counting to make sure that the movement time itself is always the same. Okay. And people start actually using the 200 or 250 milliseconds that they I mean, obviously, you don't know exactly when 200 milliseconds are up, right? Yes. So you have get a sort of a distribution. But they move much more slowly in the 250 milliseconds condition. Yeah. I mean, much more if, yeah. but yeah. Um, right. Okay. So you see the, when you try to apply these things, there's always lots of practical things that maybe you didn't think about as a theoretician, and maybe they are not all too interesting, but anyway. If you cannot apply your theory, then it's also not good, right? So you have to go through this, even though it may be painful. Um, okay, so here we see how uh, limited planning affects the endpoint variability, okay? So we said we have two reaction times. One is fast, two is slow, right? Um, and now what you see here is the endpoint variability and the endpoint accuracy. So both more or less capture something similar, just the variability. And you see that in the fast condition, so I plot your variance in the fast condition versus the variance in the slow condition, right? And so if there was no difference, you would expect all the points to be on the diagonal, right? But what you see is that most of the points are not on the diagonal and that in fact the variance in the fast condition was higher, okay? Even though the movement execution was the same, okay? So this is really an increase in variability that comes from restricting your planning time. Yeah? I just look at the endpoints, right? Of where you reach. Ah, no, these um, are angular variances. So we, in the end, we just looked at, because they were on a um, segment of a circle, so we just looked, every, all the analysis were done in angular variable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the variability. The accuracy sort of measures your deviation from the correct target, right? So that shows the same pattern. Decreased accuracy. Um, in the fast condition. Okay, then we can look also now in terms of the quantities that we're interested in, namely information utility, right? Okay, this is not very good to see, right? The diagonal would be, even I can't see it, <laughs> like this, okay? Um, so this is the utility in the fast versus the utility in the slow condition, what you see is the utility in the slow condition is higher, okay? That means the probability of a target hit was higher. And on the left, you see um, information for the fast and for the slow condition, 
Um, and there you see that the information for the fast condition is decreased. What does that mean? What is the information we measure now? It's the information between the target and the endpoint, right? So I'm asking if I show you this endpoint, can you tell me which target it was, right? And obviously, the more precise you are, the easier it is for me to tell you the correspondence between the two, right? And so in, in this setup, the information reflects nothing else but this variability, right? Because if you're less variable, then I have more information, mutual information between target and your endpoint, okay? So now we have the two critical quantities, right? And we can plot them against the curve with, uh, that basically represents this efficiency frontier, right? And so this is for all the different subjects. So you see two curves. One curve is the one where you basically do not take the execution noise into account. Of course, that would be unrealistic because we know we have this execution noise, right? And so we computed this like highlighted curve, which is the best that you can do in the presence of execution noise. And of course, this curve is fitted in the sense that we have to take into account the execution noise for each particular subject, right? Okay, but taking that into account, this curve will tell you what is the best utility, expected utility that you can achieve with a certain amount of information that you've produced. Okay? Yeah? Maybe I missed. Yeah? Uh, how, how did you compute the utility by, by the moment information? No, the utility, so that was this picture. So, the, so at the end of the movement, right, I know whether you hit or not, right? If you hit the target, it's utility one. If you miss, it's zero, right? And so we said for planning, if we take this execution noise into account, the utility will be this, right? Which is convolved with the execution noise that we ex measured separately, right? And that will be the utility that we plot here, right? And of course, this utility is lower than the one without execution noise, right? Um, okay. And now what you see is, first of all, that all these points are fairly close together, right? Um, because this is such a highly trained task that also the time differences are small, right? This is super stereotypical. So it's hard to see the, the, the effect, but of course you can clearly see it. I mean, with a, a slower condition, right, you're able to produce more information, means you produce movements that are more precise, okay? And now we can look at, okay, how close are you to the optimum? And you see these efficiency values here, and you see that uh, the people would have well above 90% efficiency if you compare them to this uh, information theoretic bounded rationality frontier, okay? Um, then we asked, okay, so now what would happen if we change the world state distribution? That means the distribution with which these targets appear, right? So we had a uniform distribution. Now we ask what happens if we take a non-uniform distribution, okay? And of course, if we do that, then um, the whole uh, function, the efficiency function will change, right? Because... Um, I mean, let's take an extreme example. If always target one appears, right, then you can solve this problem with basically zero information expenditure, right? So, of course, if we have non-uniform distribution, you can achieve more with less information, right? Um, and an important prediction here is that if we now look at the entropy over the action, um, given the target, right, that um, in this non-uniform scenario, this entropy should change. And in particular, we would assume that basically 
Frequent states would have lower entropy, and non-frequent states high entropy. So it's basically the same idea that we have in coding, right? Low, uh, short code words for fre uh, frequent symbols. And here we would basically say frequent targets, we should have less variance in the end. Non-frequent targets, more variance. I mean, these are all small effects, but that's the prediction, right? Okay, and so this is... Um, what we found also, so here for the two reaction times, um, you see here's the theoretical prediction. Um, so you see that depending on the frequency, the variance would go down. And here you see what we measured in the experiment. Indeed, we found um, this effect, right? That you adapt your, uh, your variance to the frequency of the world state. Okay? It's like a basic information theoretic idea. And then we also looked at the variances, so as I said, as the, at the efficiencies in this changed environment. Um, and here, again, this would be the efficiency line. Um, yeah, and what you can see is that here the people are not so efficient, okay? So maybe on average around 80%. Um, and the question is, why is that? Um, the possible reason could be that they've not trained enough, right? Even though we had like, um, like I think 5,000 trials in total, right? Um, I mean, these are measuring like really small distances now, so this could take thousands of trials. So I presume the, the decrease in efficiency comes mainly from that. Right? Because these small training effects, they can really take many, many thousands of trials, like this example with the uh, Cuban cigar drillers, right? Where you can even, after decades, measure small improvements. On a logarithmic scale, you can see it. Even though if you would measure it on a real scale, uh, you wouldn't see a difference. No improvement anymore. Okay. Um, so then... This is um, an earlier study where we asked, can we find deviations from expected utility decision-making in sensor motor control using this sort of free energy functions? This was one of our early attempts um, when I was still um, in Cambridge. And here, this was a simple task where basically there was a, a ball undergoing random Brownian motion in this direction and moving with constant velocity towards this bar. Okay, and this was the target line, and when the ball hits the target line, you basically, you get a cost, an error cost, like indicated by this parabola, um, but you would also pay um, a control cost, right? So if you would land the ball in the middle, uh, so the control cost depends on um, how much you basically spend effort to direct the ball close to the optimum, which would be here in the middle, right? So if you would do a lot of corrections, you would have a lot of control cost. Otherwise, uh, if you just let go, right, you would have no control cost, and the ball would just hit somewhere, and you would get whatever cost there is. Okay? Um, and the prediction here is that um, if you just care about the expected cost, then you can show that the optimal thing to do would just be this linear feedback control. So that means uh, the more the, the ball deviates to the right, the more you correct back towards the middle. And if it deviates to the left, the more you correct towards the middle. Um, but if you would optimize this sort of um, free energy cost function, okay, so again, so like a log of exponentials, um, then, <coughs> then um, you have an interaction now with the noise level, okay? So what I can do is, here, I can change the strength of the noise that governs the Brownian motion. It could be a small noise or it could be a big noise, okay? And then it would fluctuate much more. Um, and if you just care about expectation values, these fluctuations are irrelevant to you. Right? So you will choose exactly the same control strategy in both noise levels. 
Um, but if you have this kind of uh, free energy cost function, um, then you basically depends on the sign of this uh, parameter, right? This theta would be like the alpha. So we're moving slowly towards this model uncertainty in a minute. Um, and then um, what happens is that if you are uh, risk averse, right, then you control more. And that's what you see here. When the noise becomes higher, the slope of this controller becomes larger. That means you become more of a control freak. You think every little deviation you see, you become nervous, right? Because you expect the worst, right? Um, on the other hand, if you're risk seeking, then you have this kind of gambling attitude and you think, okay, if there's uncertainty, that's great because nature is friendly and good things will happen to me, right? That means there's more uncertainty, you don't have to do anything anymore because nature's doing it for you, right? And you decrease your control. That's the other attitude, okay? Um, but the important thing is that this is uh, different from what you get here, which is basically you don't care about the noise level. Okay, so, so what's interesting here is you can think of it as the amount of control you think you have about the environment or you could think about it in terms of how friendly the environment is to you, right? If you believe that essentially the environment works in your favor, you'll be risk-seeking. You could think that the environment is an extension of you in some sense, right? It doesn't do exactly what you want because otherwise it would be like theta infinite, right? But it, does not just random things, but things that help you, okay? Um, and if you're risk averse, it's the other way around. Then you think that the world is uh, mostly an unfriendly place, okay? Maybe it's not always doing the worst to you, but in general, it's good to be careful, right? And then as a consequence, you increase your control. Okay. So that's uh, what we observed. So in the top, you see a single subject. You see in the high noise, control increased. Um, we also did that for two different cost levels. That's not so important. Maybe just ignore one half. Um, and we found that basically for five out of six subjects, that's what you see down here, the gain increased. So for five out of six, basically that behavior you couldn't describe with expected utility maximization, but they were essentially risk averse. Okay. Um, then here is another study, basically looking also into the same kind of um, phenomenon, but slightly differently. So here's uh, this. So this was basically. Um, an extension of previous experiments um, where maybe this comes here. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe I explain this task quickly and then I explain how it relates to the previous work. So in this task, um, you had to, there was a target area and at the beginning of the trial, a target would be drawn from, yeah? Uh, sorry, going back to the previous two Yeah. Neutral this? this? Um, yes, I mean, Bert, I mean, in the sense that Bert Kappen also published on risk sensitive control. So these are basically, okay, what I, what I didn't explicitly say was that here it's, so you only get this linear simple con linear control law when you have basically a linear system dynamics and quadratic costs. Okay. Um, Which, is sorry. Yes, so that's why I put the parabola there, right? Um, um, and so you get this simple solution. Um, and so for this linear quadratic systems, you can also solve the risk sensitive case um, analytically. And this has done, been done, I think, by Whittle in the 70s or so. And Bert Kappen basically has worked on nonlinear extensions of both of these, the risk neutral and the so in that sense, yes, but not directly. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so as I was saying, any other questions? Okay, uh, so there was this target area where um, from a Gaussian distribution a target would be drawn um, and you would have to move to this target if you can through the force area and to the goal bar and then back. Okay, so that was the trial. Now, in the beginning, this force area was switched off, okay? So you just had to try and hit the target, move to the goal bar and back. And the important thing is that the target was displayed either precisely, so you knew exactly where it was, or it was presented as a cloud, so you had to guess where it was. So this cloud was also drawn from a Gaussian distribution, or it was not displayed at all. So if it's not displayed at all, then the best you can do is basically learn statistics of the target over many trials, and then you know basically where is the most probable location, right? You basically have to learn the prior. Um, and so this is an experiment. So it's just a question. Yeah. So now, why the target area is different for the goal bar here? So it shouldn't be the target uh, actually the goal? Or the, or yes. I, I, yes. I will explain it in a minute. So it's a bit awkward right now, but just think of it now that you try and hit the target, but then you have to move it a little bit further. You can touch the goal bar anywhere, right? And you move back. So you just have to do the move. This is the movement that we're interested in, and the other part of the movement um, will need it in a minute to make you pay a cost, so to say, immediately. Um, okay, so, th so the original experiment basically was like this without any force or anything like that, okay? And so what, uh, so actually that was done in my old lab, but b way before I was there. Um, um, so what you see illustrated here is that on the top, say the prior distribution, okay, so you know the target appears at these locations with this distribution, and then you see here the likelihood, basically, this is your observation under these different visual feedback conditions, right? So if you know exactly where the target is, the likelihood is fairly concentrated. If it's a cloud, it gets already broader. If you have no idea, then basically the likelihood is like flat, right? <clears throat> Doesn't give any information. And so that's what's illustrated here, right? So this is a good visual feedback. Uh, and then as this likelihood becomes broader, it's uh, yeah, more noisy, let's say. And then you combine these two sources of information, right? And then you get the posterior, which is this, right? Um, so X would be the location, Y would be your observation. Um, and what you see is that the mean of this posterior moves towards the prior as the visual information becomes less reliable. That makes sense, right? So I don't know, if you imagine, so the example they had was imagine you play tennis with your friend and then it's at dusk or dawn or something like that, right? And you have some kind of uh, prior distribution of where your friend will play, then the more, uh, the less you see, the more you will rely on your prior knowledge, right? Yeah? Sorry? The green line, you mean, I'm sorry, I'm red, green, colorblind, this one? Uh, this would be an example of a visual feedback or a likelihood that's even broader, right? So that means more visual noise. So say, for example, this would be clear daylight and this would be a dusk or something like this, right? Ah, no, no, this is just an illustration. So the third line in my experiment would have to be completely flat, right? I said, sorry? Does that make sense or not? No, no, no. This is basically, this picture comes from their paper. But I think even in their paper, yeah, no, they had two intermediate likelihood conditions, so in their paper it made sense. Um, okay, and now basically what you can plot is, I can plot where do you point, right? And so if you have perfect vision, right, then if I plot the error on this axis and here the true position of the target, Right? If you have perfect vision, then you will have always zero error because you can just always go perfectly to the target, right? Um, but if you have um, blurred vision, right? Let's take the other extreme. You don't see anything. You play tennis at night, right? Then the best you can do is to go to the mean of your prior, 
right? This is the highest probability of getting the ball. And so that means that would be this location, right? And if it's really there, you would have a zero error. But if the real location was to the right or to the left, you would basically have this diagonal line that gives you the error in dependence of the true location of uh, the ball, right? And so you have basically these two extremes, and then you have all the other uh, cases with intermediate vision between, right? So you can basically express this, the reliability of your stimulus as this slope, right, in your behavior if you would act optimally. That was the idea of the original paper. Yeah? Okay. So in our experiment, we also did that. So basically this would be the Bayesian posterior, where do we believe the target is given our observation, and we would have an, a quadratic cost to uh, try and hit the target, okay? And <clears throat> basically, it doesn't matter whether you just optimize expected utility or this kind of free energy cost function, the solution would always be the same, namely, the, what you take into account is the sigma prior, right, your prior uncertainty, and sigma i would correspond to the feedback uncertainty. It could be one of these three conditions, right? And so if um, sigma i was zero, that means perfect vision, right, you would just go to the point that you observe, y, but if uh, sigma, y, uh, sigma i was infinite, so that means you play at night, right, then this would go to zero. And zero in our experiment was the mean of this prior. Okay? So that's how to read this. So what you see is that the predictions are the same. Okay? And now what we wanted is to get different predictions. And in order to do that, what you have to do is you have to add a linear cost term. Okay? So here. So that's what we did. So in the experiment, that means we introduced, that's the reason now why we introduced this force area, right? So we had two scenarios. One is where the force was lower on the left and more expensive on the right, and, on the, and the other scenario was the other way around. Okay. Now, if you have such a force, um, then the prediction is simple. If you uh, care about the expected utility, right, you still do this trade-off as before, but now here, you basically bias towards the side that is, has less force, okay? And how much depends on the strength of this fourth, uh, force and the, basically the parameter that tells you how much you want to go to the target, how desperate are you to get to the target, right? This is a traded off. And, and this, importantly, this is basically a constant bias, right? It doesn't matter what is your observation, you would always bias it, it just depends on the force. And in our experiment, this force was small enough that we can neglect this factor, okay? Um, <clears throat> but whether you neglect it or not, actually for the argument it's not important, but it was a small effect, so we couldn't see a bias here. And then in the, in the case of the free energy cost function, we basically get this third term that doesn't exist here, okay? Which is again like a term for risk sensitivity or model uncertainty. Um, and this term also exists, uh, consists of these um, sigmas, the sigma of the prior and the sigma of the feedback, but now it also consists of the risk sensitivity or model uncertainty parameter and the strength of the force field. So you have an interaction between, uh, between three things, okay? So this is not a constant bias, it depends on the condition of the feedback whether you see well or not so well, okay? That's, that's the prediction. And the intuition behind it is that if, <coughs> of course, you have to be uh, sensitive to, this, uh, to the risk, and then the intuition is that if you know exactly where you are, then you basically go there. If you don't know where you are, then you might as well deviate a little bit to the side that is less costly. Okay, that's the intuitive interpretation of this formula. Um, so these are basically the, um, the predictions for the three sigma conditions. So this is when you see perfectly, right? Then you have always zero error. 
And these are when you have basically don't see anything. We go with your prior, and this is the intermediate condition with the blur. And you see that basically um, the three force conditions are these three different colors. Okay, so when there's no force, you're in the middle. And when the force is on the one side or the other, you deviate. Okay, it's like this, this offset that's predicted. Okay, and this is something that is not predicted if you would just care about the expectation value. Okay, then you would basically always just have the uh, uh, constant bias, or we said it's negligible, so it would just be always this line in the middle. So here you see the result for one subject right, that shows exactly this um, kind of behavior. And here you see the summary uh, for all the subjects. So the three columns are the three different force conditions. So the first one is the force condition that's basically been measured before. There's no force condition. You just see that if you basically increase the sensory uncertainty, the slope increases in this plot. Right? That means you uh, um, go more and more with your prior. So that's what was previously recorded. And we saw that also in, in the other force condition. What, what's new here is to look at this intercept, at this basically offset. And the key prediction was that the offset should depend on the degree of the uncertainty, right? So we have a small offset here and a larger offset here and uh, no offset there or even smaller offset. Um, and that's exactly what you see here, that the offset um, increases with the, with the model uncertainty, right? And the intuition behind it was that uh, if you would put it into words, that if you don't know where the target is anyway and you have model uncertainty, that means you don't trust your model entirely, then you may as well deviate a little bit to the less costly option, okay? Um, okay, and now I would quickly, it's, Till one o'clock, right? Yes. Yeah. So now I would talk quickly about the uh, promised model uncertainty in a little bit more detail. Okay. So in this risk sensitivity, this has already come a little bit to the fore. Mathematically, this happens because when you use the free energy as a cost function, you don't only care, so you can do a Taylor series basically in beta, and what you find is that you don't only care about the expectation value of the utility, but you care about higher order moments, like variability and so on, okay? Um, this is basically the effect that we've seen here, okay? I don't care, so these, all these experiments that I've shown you now were designed such that if you care about expectation, you don't see anything. If you care about higher order moments of the utility, then you will see a change in behavior predicted, okay? And, and, and that's what we found. So in a way, what I just demonstrated to you, you could also phrase it like that people are sensitive to higher order moments of the utility, okay? And this has also been applied to machine learning, right? So you could say, do you want to maximize expected reward or do you want to maximize also consider higher order moments, right? Or in economics, this is relevant, for example, when you go into portfolio theory. And then people say, do you uh, want to just maximize um, um, the return or do you also want to consider the variance of the return? Right? And depending on your risk attitude, you will choose a different portfolio. Okay. Um, okay. So now more into direction uh, of model uncertainty. So, um, I mean, it's all the same formula, but the viewpoint always changes slightly. So maybe the last two studies can be considered under this aspect of high order moments. Um, here, um, I want to emphasize another aspect. So this debate about different kinds of uncertainty, right, that started with night that I was mentioning earlier, is um, illustrated here in a um, simple example, okay? Namely, on the right, you have the standard decision-making problem where all the probabilities and outcomes are known, um, and now you have to decide between these two lotteries, okay? Um, on the left, we basically, for one lottery, we don't know the probabilities. I don't give you any information. And so we have an, a situation that involves ambiguity, 
And now there's two ways you can argue about this. And this is basically the kind of arguments that um, basically, yeah, I guess, are still happening in the economic sciences as well. So it's been going on for a long time. So one argument is to say, OK, if I believe in subjective probabilities, right, what I have to do is to say, OK, I don't know the probabilities. Let me make a big list of all the possibilities. Right? So all the possible lotteries going from 100% 0 to 100% 1,000. And then I have, I have to put a probability distribution reflecting my subjective belief about these possibilities. Right? Let's assume this distribution is uniform. Okay? No preference. What would happen then is that you would end up with a compound lottery that is equivalent to this one. Right? Because all the possibilities are equally probable, you will end up with a 50-50 probability, effectively. Yeah? And so, if that was the case, then there would be no difference between the scenario on the right and on the left. Okay? All the ambiguity would be translated into risk, if you reason that way. The other way to go is to say, no, I don't have a probability, and therefore, I cannot apply expected utility. Because to apply expectation, I need a probability. I don't have it, so I won't do it. Okay? It's a different kind of decision criterion that I need. Okay? And the two scenarios would be fundamentally different. Okay? And this is the kind of route that has been taken by people that have studied ambiguity. And the point here is that the same formula that we've been using all along can also be used to deal with this kind of scenario. Okay? Because I guess you can think of the model uncertainty also as a resource constraint or information constraint. Um, and the way this works is the following. Um, okay, so here's just the, I promised you the Ellsberg example, so let's quickly do it. Uh, so I have these two urns, right? The risky one and the ambiguous one. And I tell you, you get $10, which if you draw a red ball, which one do you choose? Most people would choose the, the left one, I told you, right? So now I reveal to you why this creates a paradox. So if you choose the left one, and I presume you to be Bayesian, that means you believe there's less red and blue balls in the other urn, right? Otherwise, it would be irrational to choose the other one. OK, so now I ask you with the same two urns, I give you now $10 if I draw a blue ball. Which urn do you want? And again, most people would choose the left one. Okay? Maybe you find yourself doing that as well in your mind. Okay? So now the question is, are you crazy or not? Okay? If we put the two um, probabilities next to each other, right, that would mean that you believe at the same time that there's less red than blue and more red than blue in the right urn. And then you find it quite difficult to justify why this would be a rational belief, right? OK, so salvation is coming, don't worry. Um, so that's why it's called a paradox. Um, OK, so I said we need a decision criterion in the extreme case that's not probabilistic, right? So a simple one that has been used a lot is this is maximum criteria, right? This is worst case reasoning. If you don't know, assume the worst case, and then if things happen, it can only get better, right? It's an old uh, wisdom, I guess. Um, but this is also extreme, right? This, this makes sense if you know absolutely nothing, um, and maybe it's, it's critical. Um, but maybe you have a model, right? So you have a model about the world, but you're not sure about the model. Okay? And that doesn't mean that you're not sure to a degree where you say, OK, I don't know anything. But you say, OK, I know a model, but maybe it's not quite right. And um, maybe a distribution in the neighborhood would also be OK to describe, would be possible. right? I would regard that possible. And so what you can do is basically <coughs> you can say, OK, I take my model, and I look at models that lie in the neighborhood of this model. Right? This is what people do that deal with robust uh, 
uh, decision making. Um, and I want this, so obviously we recognize the KL divergence, and we want this to be smaller than some number, right? And as a picture, we could imagine that we have P0 in the space of all probability distributions, and we basically we draw a circle around P0, right, and say all these distributions that, li that lie in this circle, I think, are reasonable. Okay, they could still be true. I'm not sure. And the ones that are outside the circle, I sort of dismiss. Okay, and now, and now, of course, you can make the circle very small. In fact, you can make it tiny, such that just P0 is in there, and that means you know the model for sure, right? Or you can make it infinitely large, in which case you don't know anything, okay? So, so these two kinds of perfect knowledge and knowing nothing are the extremes of this, okay? Um, and then, so basically what you then do is you take exactly this uh, functional, right? And you say, okay, let me choose the probability that leads to a worst case. So you take a minimization, okay? So that's when you would look for an action, you would maximize, right? But I was saying before, minimization is when you anticipate an opponent or when you do robust inference, if you remember, or robust decision making. So this would be the second case. So, <clears throat> so we're looking for the worst <clears throat> inside the circle of models that you regarded as reasonable, right? So you basically you go to this circle and you look at each distribution and say, which is the worst? And you find it. And that would be your robust belief, your robust model, okay? Because if it's any other model in this circle, it can only be better, right? Yeah? Yeah, it's exactly the same way to look at it. Yeah, exactly. You think it's less about robustness, it's more about assuming that, that you. Yes. It's even there's something to hide and then yes. something cheated. Yes. But the mathematical language, I agree that. That's exactly. The mathematics is exactly the same. So, I mean, I was also making a similar story right in the previous example, uh, where saying that you believe the world is like harming you fundamentally or not. I mean, it's the same kind of story you could make up here as well, and it would be exactly the same mathematics. Um, and in fact, people do that, right? There's like a lot of research on this adversarial decision making. <clears throat> okay, and so you see here, what happens if we now take, what is the value of the lottery? Of course, the free energy as before, right? Um, now evaluate it as a minimization problem. And then, uh, basically, I have this graph, I have the value, I have the model uncertainty parameter here, right? And um, if I have no model uncertainty, the value will just be the expected utility under my belief, right? If I have model uncertainty, the value of the lottery is going to decrease, right, to the minimum in the end, in the extreme case. So that means, if I now look at my two lotteries, right, 1,000 and 0 and 500, if I would want to be robust, right, completely robust, I would just say, what is the worst that could happen? I get nothing. So the value of the lottery on the left is zero in that case, right? Um, so what's better, nothing or 500? 500, I take that one, right? But it doesn't have to be like that, right? You could also say, okay, I believe it's 50-50, but maybe, I could be wrong to some extent, right? Maybe 70, 30 would still be okay, but I don't believe it's uh, <coughs> totally rigged, right? Um, and that would then determine the value of this lottery, depending on how much you trust in your model. And of course, how much you trust in your model can depend on um, how often this model has been applied through learning, for example, okay? And so that's an experiment that we did here. Um, so in this experiment, um, people were basically, so we tried to translate this, this Ellsberg earn task. Um, that's what we did up here, right? So we have on the left, the, the risky earn, it always shows red and blue balls. Uh, 
And on the right, you have the ambiguous urn. Um, now, the payoff here was just again with a force. Right? So I think whenever a blue ball was drawn with the probability of the urn, you have to pay this uh, force to move and subject one to avoid that. Um, but the more important thing is that the ambiguous urn was not necessarily fully ambiguous because we could show you samples from the ambiguous urn. And so that's what I meant with learning. Right? So if I show you no samples of the ambiguous urn, it would be like Ellsberg. If I show you like two balls from the urn, then you already have an idea. If I show you 10, you have more idea. If you show 20, you have more. If I show 50, at some point you know. Okay? Um, and the question is how did, so we have now degrees of ambiguity. Right? Uh, how would that affect your choice behavior? And in the bottom, we basically try to come up with an equivalent task, uh, like a, against a target hitting task, where you had to decide, do you want to hit uh, a visible target? That would be on the right here. And it was trained for each subject such that the target has exactly the size you would hit the target 50% of the time. Okay, so this was adapted. Or do you like the target on the left, which um, basically is partially or fully occluded? Okay? Which could be smaller or bigger, of course. You don't know. Um, okay? Okay, so now let me explain to you this um, in the case of the urn because it's easy to, under easy to understand. So here, for the urn, we were interested in particular trials. So we created these particular trials, namely trials in which I show you the same proportion of red and blue. Okay? So if I show you, for example, one red, one blue, two red, two blue, five red, five blue, why are we interested in these trials? Because if you would do a Bayesian posterior about them, right, they would all have the same mean, but the more balls you see, the more you would concentrate around the idea that indeed the ratio of the urn is 50-50. Okay? Does that make sense? So again, this idea boils down to, if you just care about expectation, all these cases are the same to you. If you care about higher order moments, they're not the same to you, okay? Um, that's essentially the mathematical difference that will kick in here. And so when you just care about expected utility, right, then I always have 50-50. The known urn, the risky urn, was also 50-50, and that makes a simple prediction if you just care about the expectation value, like proposed by expected utility theory, you should be indifferent between the ambiguous urn and the risky urn, You're independent of how many balls I show you. If, however, you are sensitive for the amount of information that I'm giving you, right, <clears throat> then the value that you give to the ambiguous option depends on how much information you have been gathering. Right? Because that will change also the degree of model uncertainty, so to say. And now, again, it depends whether you are basically positive or negative with respect to this uncertainty. Right? Um, so you can think that if you don't know, that's a great thing, or if you don't know, that's a bad thing. Um, now, if we stick with this idea it's a bad thing, then, uh, which was the Ellsberg uh, finding, right? then you would devalue the ambiguous urn. But the more you learn about it, the less this devaluation is, until in the end, basically, you have the same value um, than uh, when you have the risky urn. Right? These are just two curves for two different, say, attitudes. OK, okay so these are the single subject data. Maybe I'll show you the summary. You can see it more easily. Um, so you see here for the earned task, right, the amount of information that you have, and you see on the y-axis the probability of choosing the risky option, okay? And you see that if I reveal no information about the ambiguous earn, there's like a, I don't know, say 80% tendency to choose the known earn, just like in Ellsberg's case. Okay? 
And then the more information I reveal to you, the more this tendency goes down until you've seen so much that you're indifferent between, I mean, effectively, the ambiguous urn becomes a risky urn, right, if I show you enough balls at some point. Um, Funnily, in the motor task, we saw the opposite trend, okay? So there, people preferred the um, ambiguous option, and we were thinking for a long time, it's like, uh, I think, one and a half years in the end, why this is, and we tried lots of stuff, because initially we thought maybe it has to do with that the uncertainty here is extrinsic, and here this uncertainty comes from your own body, and so on, and you think maybe your body is friendly to you, I don't know. That's all not true. The simple explanation is that it's the way you represent the uncertainty. That's what makes the difference. So if I would represent the uncertainty in the urn example, because that's what we did in the end, also with um, these sort of bars, right? And I would explain to you that the, the size of the bar relates to the probability of green or red or whatever, and I occlude it and so on, then people would show the opposite uh, sort of behavior towards this. Um, and so it's quite interesting. So the conclusion from that was that it really depends how you represent uncertainty to people. Say, I don't know, say you're a climate science researcher and you show error bars to a politician. Think twice how you will plot them. That's the... Uh, the side effect here. But for us, the important thing was that, okay, either way, <clears throat> you cannot explain the choice with expected utility, right? There was always a bias um, that would take the amount of ambiguity into account. Um, and this you could uh, basically describe with a free energy uh, valuation that takes also into account how much information you've seen, right? And then you get basically these, you can get these um, response curves. Um, okay, so I think I'll stop here, right? And then we can continue tomorrow. Thanks.